Jaya Prabhuji. Hello, welcome to the Retro Progressive Yoga Institute. My name is Swami Omkarananda. I am a disciple of Prabhuji, and in this institute I share my own understandings about the teachings of Prabhuji. In this course, I'm sharing the wisdom that Prabhuji writes in the book Tantra Liberation in the World. It's a very extensive book and therefore we are doing a series of courses. This is the course number three and it's the fifth lecture. Of course, I recommend to watch the lectures gradually, but everyone has his standalone topic. And the topic that we will deal today is the topic of austerity and asceticism. We are talking about the Atimarga, the path of the Shaiva ascetics, which creates the proper conditions for the development later on of the Tantric revelation. We call this sex pre-Tantric sect because still the Agamas were not revealed and they took different approach to the search for the divine. Yet they have a lot in common with the later Tantricas and therefore scholars that try to reconstruct the um, unfoldment of the Tantric miracle are thinking that actually from within these ascetics of the Atimarga sects, probably the first Tantricas emerge and they create the proper conditions for the development of this very powerful revelation. So asceticism and austerity will be the topic of this lecture. Let's learn what is asceticism. What means asceticism? The term asceticism comes from the Greek word askesis, which means exercise, training or practice. In ancient Greek, this term was often used in the context of physical exercise or athletic training. In the context of spiritual or religious practices, askesis refers to the disciplined training or rigorous exercises undertaken by individual to achieve spiritual goals, self-improvement or union with the divine. We are studying about the Pashupatas, the first ascetic sect from within the Shaiva movement. We studied in previous lectures how from the uh, Vedic roots that worship a pantheon of different gods, Rudra uh, emerges as a very predominant uh, god, taking the, um, the worship later on to become Shiva, his benevolent aspect, and of course being seen by his devotees as the all-pervading god like the Brahman of the Upanishads. Now we see this um, movement, this spiritual awakening from within the movement of the Shaivism. Shaivism was and become very prominent till today as one of the mainstreams of Hinduism. And it has its own scriptures and its own um, practices and type of worship. And the main practice was the devotional practice, the repeating of the holy names of Shiva, the worship in the temple, the attending to the celebrations, the um, recitation of the pastimes of the mythology of Shiva. That was the Shaiva movement, the devotional, the Bhakti movement. From within these movements, certain um, individuals wanted to take spirituality a step forward. And this is how we see the beginning of ascetic sects. The ascetics take a totally different way of life. And they take upon themselves a life of renunciation and a life of austerities, as tapas is they assume and they commit for a lifetime vow of tapasya, of austerity. And therefore, I want to dedicate this class to analyze what tapas means. What is the importance of tapas from within 
the spiritual practice? What is the component of this practice? How this practice was expressed in different cultures and spiritual movements of the world? And finally, how Prabhuji, from within the retro-progressive path, see an uh, advice about tapas. So let's get started. What is asceticism? Asceticism is a practice of self-discipline, self-denial, and abstaining from worldly pleasures, often in pursuit of spiritual or religious elevation. It has a long and diverse history that spans different cultures and religions. So here we are. I don't want to be necessarily in the ascetics of the year 200 of the current era. I want to be here in our reality. We are still being born in forgetfulness and feeling this lack of something lack of meaning, lack of direction, lack of knowledge. I mean, a constant feeling that something is missing. And everyone in his way, according to his upbringing, understanding or aspiration, look for something in life, how to live life. Every human being that was born somehow looks how to live life. It, it seems that we are um, imitating, of course, our parents, our grandparents, our peers, but yet there is something that looks for uh, my own way to grow in this garden of God, my own perfume. And how, how, what, what is my goal, what I supposed to do? And this um, urge bring human beings in different times to look for the way for self-realization. And there are those who look for the self-realization within the spiritual effort, the spiritual um, endeavor. If my aspiration is for something beyond the ordinary, beyond what my senses can give me, what is the way to achieve it? What is the way? What is the path? And this question was asked again and again, generation after generation in different parts of the world. And the answer, answers may vary. But there is a point that we see repeated and appear in almost every culture, which is the topic of asceticism. The, from within religions, from within societies, there are some individuals who choose this path. And they are usually those who want to take the spiritual search very seriously. And for that, they are ready to give up the pleasures of the world with the conviction that in order to achieve something beyond the senses, I need to restrain the senses. That there is a contradiction between my human experience and what I aspire to experience. If I want to elevate, I need to give up the worldly. This is not an obvious conclusion. And there are many that can support that and many that can very oppose very much to this. There are many that can fit them for their development and there are those who can be uh, detrimental to their advancement. But what we want to focus is the Pashupatas, those who saw this, and there were many movements even before them, and we will study soon, why they choose this, why the self-denial, the self-discipline, the restraint of the pleasures of the world will reach or will help me to reach spiritual realization. That is the topic of the lecture. We will Start by seeing and uh, putting this in context and seeing how this concept, this path developed in different cultures. Asceticism. Ascetic practices can be traced back to ancient Mesopotamia, 3500 before the current era, where individuals 
practiced self-mortification and fasting as a means of spiritual purification and connecting with the divine. The very ancient humans living in the civilization of Mesopotamia, one of the oldest in the world, already can, we can see that they go to this conclusion. Which pleasures they had back then, right? 5,500 years ago, yet they understood that in order to achieve the divine, I need to give up something. It's hard to know exactly what were their motives and how they saw the world, but I'm always fascinated by, by seeing that the, the unrest of the humans to find their source. This unbearable situation of not knowing from where we came and not knowing where we go and who we are, what is our purpose, it keeps us searching, searching for the right way, searching for the direction. And even, even on account of the pleasures that this world can give. So we can see that this um, direction it's ancient and was inherited generation after generation and passing from culture to other cultures in a way that we see its um, expression in, in many different times. Yet we notice that those who are taking this are usually the very serious seekers that understand that um, in order to achieve the spiritual realization, I need to give up something. I need to give up something from the world. This is not an obvious thought, it's, it's an interesting thought, but also we see that those who dare to take this path, and uh, I'm sure the witnesses of, of those brave souls that want to, to take this uh, difficult option, so others probably were inspired and saw their development and what they achieved and these teachings went pass on and of course we see the teachings also in the scriptures. So let's see how this story continues. Hinduism, the Vedic Rishis. Vedic Rishis were often ascetics which practiced renunciation, self-discipline and focused on spiritual pursuit. They were seers who transmitting spiritual wisdom and composed the Vedic hymns by divine inspiration. They will live in forests and engage in rigorous practices such as meditation, contemplation and austerities. 1500 before the current era. This is the estimated time where the Vedas were properly put it in writing, not Revealed. maybe it's much ancient, it's hard to trace the exact date, but we know about the Vedic Rishis. In Hinduism it's hard to do generalizations because it's really a religion of the path of the individual, but many of the Vedic Rishis were ascetics. And by the grace of their asceticism and their focus on the divine, they were able to canalize, to channel the Vedic hymns, which praise the divine and give us the spiritual wisdom. So their choice of life, their ch they choose to live in the forest when there were already cities. So the life of the forest is a life of austerities and the life in the city is a life within society, within the rules of society. Back in ancient civilization, there were cities where there are rules within the cities, and also the Vedic revelation brought the rules how to organize a city, a society, a group of people living together in a spiritual way. And this is one of the gifts of the Vedic revelation that, that allowed the development of India with the spiritual values in the center, a very beautiful part of the human history. But then, those who were the spiritual leaders were those who didn't choose this life. They chose the life of 
isolation, living in solitude, in direct connection with the divine, in forests, in uh, renunciation, in focus, in meditation. So those are the, the examples, those are the luminaries of our spiritual search. And we see that, yeah, self-mortification was one of the elements of their practice. Sannyasis, renunciation, sannyasa, and practices of self-denial are found in the Upanishads. Ascetic practices were seen as a means to attain spiritual liberation, moksha, and break the circle of birth and death, samsara. The Vedic revelation brought a spiritual path for every walk of life. You have uh, the option, the possibility to live a spiritual life according to um, four different ashramas. It can be Brahmacharya, the ashrama, the way of life of the students, of the young people. Then you have the Griasta, it's the path of the married couples making a family and living a spiritual life within a family. Banaprasta, those are the renunciants, can be the retired after raising a family, the seeker retires for a life of isolation and spiritual search. And we have the sannyasis. Sannyasis are the monks, the Vedic monks, the Hindu monks who never married, that from being, from being Baramacharya or being students, they choose a life of celibacy, self-denial, renunciation, wandering, about non-possession, all the vows of renunciation. Now the Upanishads are the conclusion of the Vedas, the last part of the Vedic a revelation, and it's, a, it's known that the Upanishads are meant for sannyasis, for those who choose to dedicate completely to the pursuit of spiritual wisdom. And the sannyasis were um, educated in the, uh, in the Upanishadic wisdom, it's the Vedantic wisdom, which promotes a life of renunciation. Renunciation in the pursuit of moksha. There are many, way, many means, many goals that the humans can, uh, can pursue. And the most elevated is to get liberated from the illusion from the ignorance, from this confusion, who we are and what we're supposed to do. So this is how the sannyasis took upon themselves to, uh, to live an exemplary life of renouncing worldly enjoyments and to teach spiritual wisdom to others. So we see a very strong tendency for asceticism and tapasya within the Upanishads and within the sannyasas, the monastic orders of the Vedanta. Shaiva ascetics, renouncement who follow the path of Shaivism, who dedicate their lives to spiritual practices, renouncing worldly attachment and seeking union with the divine. Shaiva orders include the Naga Sadhus, the Lingayats and the Pashupatas. Once the Shruti a revelation finalized with the Upanishads. We see later on the Smriti, the tradition, continue and develop and uh, per convey spiritual wisdom. We have the Itihasas, we have the um, Puranas, and later on the Agamas of the Tantric revelation. So what we um, see hap happening in this very dynamic a spiritual search of India, which is admirable. It's so diverse and so wide, expressed in different languages and in different parts of India, and uh, with so much colorful and variety, and, and still keeping the direct experience of the divine as, as a goal, as the, as the center of everyone's aspiration we see the emergence of a devotional movement, the devotion to Shiva, in which everyone can practice, married and unmarried, have uh, the 
uh, opening to practice this spiritual path. But within them, we see the emergence of ascetics. And the Pashupatas was one of the first sects. Uh, later on, we will find others, like the Lingayats, the Nagas, and Prabhuji speaks about all of them in his book, so we will comment about them later on. But the, the, these groups, what was peculiar in them, that besides taking upon themselves this inheritance of the ascetic life, they also engage in devotion and in ritual. This was the main focus on them, because no matter how many efforts we can do for self-denial, it's clear that the connection, the reconnection with the source is a grace. So they beg for the grace, for the compassion of Rudra, their beloved Rudra, often worshipping in the form of the Shiva Lingam, and uh, hoping to get reunited by the mere compassion. There is no merit that you can do big enough to deserve the reconnection, but the Shaivas just pray for the devotion of Rudra. Vaishnava sadhus, renouncant who follow the path of Vaishnavism, Vaishnava ascetics dedicate their lives to spiritual practices, detachment from worldly affairs, and devotion to Lord Vishnu. One of the orders is Gaudiya Vaishnavism tradition. Vaishnavism is another of the big currents from within Hinduism. They worship Lord Shiva, often in different manifestations, such as Lord Krishna, which is the Ishta Devata of Prabhuji and of our ashram. And they, they also have, of course, the bhakti practices for everyone, but those who choose to take Vaishnavism eh, as a lifetime commitment, they become sadhus. We can see them till today living a life of renunciation, living a life of eh, refraining from spiritual satisfaction of family or sensual pleasures and undertaking austerities and asceticism. One of the traditions that later appears in, from within Vaishnavism is the Gaudiya, the Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which is very close to Prabhuji's heart, uh, the example of Lord Chaitanya, who was a very prominent scholar, a brilliant teacher of philosophy. He was happily married, but yet the calling of the divine didn't stop him from renouncing this life of honor, recognition, wife, and choosing to dedicate to the divine. And we see how uh, just this grace that we talked before conquer his heart and the connection and the dedication to the divine give light to generations. Just the example of a, an amazing master, an amazing example of devotion, of ecstasy. And he brought the, the gift of the Maha Mantra to everyone who is enchanted by the sweetness of this mantra. And of course, conquered the heart of Prabhuji when he was 17 years old. And this is how Lord Chaitanya continued to inspire uh, many generations later on to endeavor in a life of devotion to Lord Krishna. Around the year 700, before the current era, we see the emergence of Jainism. Jain monks and nuns are called sadhus and sadvis. There are many ascetics orders till modern days. Jainism places a strong emphasis on ascetic practices. They observe rigorous practices of fasting, meditation, detachment from worldly possessions, and absolute non-violence. Within Jainism, asceticism is very central. There are many monastic orders of monks and nuns who undertake this type of life. They are really serious about asceticism and they 
truly see it as a way to reconnect from the divine. They get this grace, this gift, generation after generation, inspiring many people till today to undertake this type of life in which they renounce in an absolute way to all worldly possession. They go without clothes, many of them, rounding without destination, without the home, totally surrendered to the grace of the divine and uh, practicing the path of absolute non-violence. And this is so um, serious for them that even they walk around with a broom just uh, making sure not to step upon any insect, any ant, or not to breathe any insect so they cover their mouth. So they really are in, in the path of making from this world a different place, how far we are from absolute non-violence. But if there are human beings who, with understanding and with personal commitment at a very personal price, they take this path, it means that it's possible for our race one day that all will choose uh, this type of life. So we keep this flame, the flame of spiritual wisdom, Many, very, very few individuals maybe can choose it, but it means that it stays as an aspiration, as an ideal, as a, a way for humanity to develop. And who knows, the, the human beings has this choice and by this message, in go, this message going on around it might inspire the heart of unexpected. The spiritual call is a, it's a very um, illogical call uh, that sometimes appears in the most unexpected hearts. So it's a matter of praying and connecting that the, I will be called for a life that will give the fulfillment that I aspire so much. Buddhism appears around the 600 before the current era. There are many monastic orders within the different branches of Buddhism. Theravada, Mahayana, Zen, Tibetan Buddhism, and the forest tradition. Asceticism played a significant role in the life of the historical Buddha. Before attaining enlightenment, he practiced extreme asceticism, including severe fasting and self-mortification. However, he later rejected extreme austerity and advocated for the middle way, a balance between indulgence and asceticism. Buddha, what an inspiring example. He tried, he saw, he saw the ascetics in his time. He tried to take this asceticism all the way but then he discovered that must be a balance between indulgence and asceticism, must be a middle way. And this is what he taught and this is what keeps inspiring. Till today, we have ascetics, orders of monks, of Buddhist monks, following this middle path, which includes the practice of austerities, the practice of renunciation, denial, self. There is something in this theme that we see over and over appearing but of course, not every, everyone needs to choose this path, but the, um, those who want this and nothing else, so the path of a Buddhist type of asceticism, which is in our terms still very, uh, very serious, a very serious commitment for this practice. So this is the choice that we see orders in every one of the Buddhist tradition. Judaism is a very ancient religion, but around the year 200 before the current era, we see the emergence of a very peculiar sect. It call, it, they were called the Essenes. The Essenes were a Jewish sect that existed during the Second Temple period. They practiced a form of asceticism and communal living. They emphasized simplicity, celibacy, communal property, 
and the pursuit of holiness. The Essenes is a fascinating sect that probably they were much ancient, but we see and we have traces of them from the 200 before the current era. Judaism, in general, is not a religion that promotes asceticism as a means to achieve the divine. It's very interesting because they see the divinity in the word, so they sanctify the, the words as a connection with the divine in a way of sanctifying and following the rules of the Torah that it's in the, in the expressing 613 precepts and of course in a whole way way of living, way of worship, way of praying and way of bringing divinity in, uh, every, in everyday activities. So asceticism as it is, is not part of, although it's not prohibited, but it's not part. But there was this very peculiar sect, the Essenes, from the Second Temple, that they live while the Temple was existing, but they offer an alternative. They went apart from the worship in the Temple, considering the slaughter of animals a practice to be condemned. Very, they were uh, considered the Jewish for every means, but they noticed the corruption that already was going on around the temple worship, and they chose to pursue a life of purity. And they live usually in communities, uh, practicing very strictly the laws of the Torah, the laws of the Shabbat, Shabbat and um, engaging in a life of austerities and simple living in order to focus on the divine. So I invite you to learn more about them because it's so interesting how from within the same tradition can emerge some individuals that, that look, look for the divine, look for other alternative ways of living that will allow them these realizations. And of course, we have from them the, it said that the Dead that Sea Scrolls were uh, written by them and we have a whole spiritual inheritance from these individuals that choose to live within Judaism but in a form of asceticism. Christianity, we see the emergence of asceticism within Christianity around the year 200 of the current era. The desert fathers and mothers who lived in seclusion in the Egyptian desert. They sought to live lives of radical devotion to God, renouncing worldly attachments and pursuing spiritual perfection through prayer, fasting, solitude, and self-discipline. They played a significant role in the development of Christian monasticism. Also within Christianity, we see how at certain point, not from the very beginning, but at certain point, certain individuals choose to take this way of Christian life for a, with totality. And the first one were the desert fathers and mothers who went to live in the Egyptian desert. We see till today their monasteries living in, a, in the mountains of the desert with complete isolation from society and a focus, a total focus on prayer, fasting and austerity. And um, they were the inspiration for many monastic orders later on that they undertook this path. And we, of course, see the still today, the Christian monasteries with monks, nuns and choosing this life of simplicity and service and dedication to develop this very intimate relationship with the divine. We can go on and on speaking how this uh, way, this alternative to look for the divine appears in different religions. I just brought the main examples, but the human being in his pursuit for the divine often arrive to the, conclu arrive to the conclusion 
that I need to live a type of life that would be conducive for this development. And if the desire for that is strong, the determination is strong, so they will and they may undertake a, a, a path of giving up worldly enjoyments. I always think, you see how ancient is this tendency. And we are now in the year 2023 with so many worldly pleasures, pleasure that they can only dream about in the, in the Mesopotamian civilization. So our challenge is even greater today. But the, the, this uh, seed, this fire, tapas is fire, the austerity is fire that burns in the heart, is something that might happen in certain individuals that understand that nothing else can give me what I'm looking for. I want to continue by sharing the words of Arthur Schopenhauer, who was a German philosopher from the 19th century, that he was very um, occupied it on contemplating the human life, the human suffering, and the pursuit of happiness. And in his search, beside studying very deeply all the Western philosophy, what they have to say, the different thinkers and philosophers of all times about the topic, he was exposed to the knowledge of the Upanishads and probably to the Buddhism. And contemplating in himself, in his own life, he wrote the following words. The ascetic seeks to annihilate his will to live in order to liberate himself from suffering by renouncing the desires and attachments that bind him to the world of appearances. He strives to transcend the individual will and attain a state of inner peace. In this renunciation, he discovers that his true and ultimate nature is not the striving, desiring individual, but something beyond and apart from it. Asceticism becomes a means to detach oneself from the relentless circle of desire and find liberation from the pain and dissatisfaction that accompanies it. Arthur Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation. He contemplated a lot upon the human suffering. What actually is the source of this suffering? And he concluded that our relentless desires unsatisfied desires and needs that we are constantly bind in this will of satisfying desires and then becoming satisfied and again they race again and if we satisfy them we become bored and if we don't satisfy them we uh, suffer so either we suffer from unsatisfied desire or from the boredom of satisfied desire we are in a loop we are in a depression we are trapped. So he had, had deep admiration for ascetics and he tried to live somehow a kind of ascetic life, although he knew that he, you need to be very capable of choosing this path. And he, although he was quite secluded, but it was by no means a perfect ascetic. But he admired the path and he said that there are two paths actually to um, get free from this unbearable suffering, either aesthetics through the path of art or asceticism, the path of renunciation. So how is so ascetics? Ascetics are those who deal with the source of a problem, not with satisfying or solving the problem, but what is the source of the problem. This um, constant flow of desires, these attachments, this clinging to the source of our satisfaction. And those who are able and capable of renouncing this desire and saying, no more, I will not live enslaved by my desires, are a source of inspiration because they can break free 
from this will. And the emphasis that he put is that the problem of our will is our individual will. And as, as long as we are bent and entrapped by our egoistic will, we are, we are meant to suffer. But there is a higher will. There is another will that we are not connected to. And that as long as we are focusing our egoistic needs, we will miss. But if we go beyond them, we can connect to something that is bigger than us, that is greater than us. We are part of a big will that wants to do through us. And there he saw the self-realization. I want to summarize his position in the following way. He identified a problem. He wants to think about this problem of human suffering. Then he wants to recognize the source of it, from where the suffering comes. He recognized that actually the desires are the source of the suffering. Therefore, if I want to solve this, we have two ways or a life of satisfaction of desires, or a life of denying desires. Now, the, um, the satisfaction of desires, Schopenhauer proved that it's impossible to satisfy them, because the more we satisfy, the more they erase better and stronger. And if either if we satisfy them, we still suffer from lack of meaning and disconnection. So there is no way to satisfy him. And the way he saw most proper is a way of denying desires. And this is very difficult. Maybe uh, uh, the selected ascetics are able to do it. So I want to think by ourselves a bit about these two directions. Why? Because I see these two choices in many different cultures of the world. We have the, in Greece, for example, we have certain sects that they choose the path of satisfaction of the senses, famously the hedonism path. Try to live a life of maximizing your pleasures, and this will be a life worth living. Those are those, like the cynics, that they said, no, a life of living in simplicity and in renunciation is the way to achieve happiness because the source of suffering is the desire, so happiness is to go beyond the desires. And the, the Epicureans that said, yes, a life of maximizing desires, but if you are enslaved by your desires, you also suffer, so satisfaction with moderation. Even in, in Israel, we talk about the Essenes, they choose one path, but there were other sects, like the, Sadduc the Sadducees, that they choose, no, a life of actually fulfilling desires. That will be a path of connection to our uh, source. So the, the, um, this debate's still going on, on what is the way to live the life. And we don't get a formula, we don't get an instruction manual for how to live our life. It needs to be our self-discovery. So we have these two ways. And the uh, Atimarga, the, the sages of the Atimarga, the sages of the Pashupatas, they choose definitely the path of self-denial. But we see a very interesting development within the Atimarga in which they start later on to experiment with elements of a sense enjoyment from within their practice. So they went and incorporate, and we will study this in later classes, how to, not to deny, but not to enslave ourselves from the desires, but still to experiment with them, still to live them, experience them, but not becoming slaves. So this is how we see this development in the human search that later on brought the path of Tantra. What has to say Tantra about, as Prabhuji writes, while the ascetic path suggests calming or extinguishing the inner fire, the Tantric path ignites and redirects it to the source. Prabhuji. The path of Tantra suggests a third way. We have 
on one side the option of extinguishing and eliminating our desires, choking this fire, this inner fire that Schopenhauer called the will to live that is driving us to experiment. We have the path of just enslave ourselves from our desires. And rightly so, he said, and we see that it can lead us to even more suffering. The tantric path says, take this inner fire, instead of extinguishing it and disconnecting from life, ignite it in the pursuit of the source from where these fires come. The path of Tantra is the path of Shakti. Shakti is, she is the embodiment of Shiva in this world. She is Shiva. And this word should not be denied. If you deny this word, you deny part of Shiva. If you look for Shiva, look for it in this world. That was the amazing um, the development of the tantric attitude that he said, yes, you want to enjoy, of course you want to enjoy, because Shakti, you want to enjoy Shakti. And Shiva wants to reunite with Shakti. How Shiva, the consciousness, can reunite with the material? Through you, through your contact, because you have consciousness and you have a body, and you can enjoy through the body this experience of being alive. So it's not to enslave yourself from your mind and satisfaction of desires. It's not to restrain the desires. This is not the path of Tantra. Tantra denied asceticism, although because it's very inclusive, ascetics were not excluded, but they were not encouraged. The way of Tantra is to replace asceticism with ritualism. And in the ritual, all the sensual pleasure are, are ritualized. This is how we see even, um, even wine as part of the offerings, even sex as part of the practices, even uh, uh, intoxication as a very ritualized way to access other uh, levels of consciousness. So we have a third way which allows us to enjoy this world without being enslaved. Prabhuji quotes often this uh, sentence, be in the world, but do not belong to the world. Because you can live a life of um, enjoying, uh, but seeing that who is the enjoyer? Look for the enjoyer. Prabhuji always says, leave this objective. The problem that we have, this dissatisfaction, this will to live, and the problem that all the generations try to solve and the problem that Schopenhauer dealt so much is not a problem. It's your human condition. Prabhupada doesn't describe the, this as a problem. It's the human experience. The human experience is a problem only if you disconnect from the source, from the, is at the object level, objective level of the object and matter. I cannot give you the solution because the problem is subjective. The disconnection is the problem. So don't try to deny the enjoyment of the world or engage in the enjoyment. So all this will not give you what you are looking for. What you are looking for is the source. This is how he said, redirect it to the source. The subject, the one who observes, the one who suffers and the one who enjoys. Who is that one? And that one, if you look carefully, you will see that that one is silence is watching, is peace, and is what you aspire so much. So it's just a matter of, instead of identifying with the body, looking for who is the one who observes the body, who is the one who observes the experience. And then whatever is the experience will be become irrelevant, either enjoyable or uh, not enjoyable. It's part of a movie. It's part of the movie, but you are the screen of the movie, unaffected by whatever happens in the movie. So all the path of the retro-progressive is to go into the discovery of the background of life, the background of the experience, the one who pays attention to the enjoyer and the enjoyed. But there is someone that knows both, and this is where he's leading us with this path. So. We will continue in the next class speaking about how Prabhuji 
explains tapas and austerity within the retroprogressive path. Thank you very much. We will meet in the next class. Jaya Pravachi.